your mercy and grace. Receive our worship, Father. All my words are full.
God can do it again. Amen. It's found in Joshua chapter 3. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 17. Joshua chapter 3. God can do it again, right? Have you ever heard of those countdown list of songs? You might have heard of them, right? Like There's like the 100 greatest songs of the 70s, and they count them down all the way to the number one song of the 70s. And then there's the 100 greatest songs of the 80s, and so on and so on, right? Things like that, right? They have a big old countdown, and they used to have them on, on VH1. Anybody remember VH1? Well, they would have them there, and then you would all day long, you would see song after song after song. They go through all 100 till they get to the top one, right? To the very best one, the number one, right? Well, one of my favorite of those 100 countdowns are the one-hit wonders. Have you ever heard of that, right? <laughs> the one-hit wonders. You know what a one-hit wonder is, right? It's one of those songs, right, that some guy from, that nobody knows, right, comes along, or a girl, they come along, and they have a huge hit, right, and they, every time you turn on the radio, they're playing their song, but then about a month later, they're gone, and you never hear it from these people anymore, right? They go back into nothingness where they came from, right? <laughs> Here's some of these songs. Tell me if you remember any of these. You remember any of these songs? How about this song? Everybody was Kung Fu Fight. Remember that one? Hey, cool. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody remember who sang that? Uh, no, because he's the one who won there. The black guy. Him, right? The black guy. Oh, no. What's his Carl name? Douglas was oh. his name. But who cares, right? It's just it's a good yeah. time, right? How about this one? Harper Valley PTA. Anybody remember that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the day my mama sucked it too, right? <laughs> Did you know uh, Jenny C. Riley sang that one? Did you know she was a gospel singer also? But she had a one hit. She was a one hit wonder, right? How about this one? Play that funky music. Why, remember that one, right? <laughs> yeah. Does anybody remember who sang that one? Wild Cherry, right? We don't remember them because they're nobodies, right? They came, they had a big hit, right? What about this one? The 99 Luft Balloons. I don't even know how to pronounce that, that one. Yeah. The girl named Nina, she was a German or something, right? It's the 99 Red Balloon, but how about this one? Who let the dogs out? Remember that one? Hey, another one hit wonder, right? <laughs> how about, the, how about the Tony Basil song? Anybody remember Tony, the girl Tony Basil? Yeah. What was it? Hey, Mickey, you're yeah. so funny. Remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> you're so funny, you blow my mind. Hey, Mickey. That was dumb, but it, it was a one hit wonder. Right? <laughs> yeah. This is one of my, yeah, this is one of my, one of my favorites that I really like. I don't know why I like it. I can't even tell you why. Dexy's Midnight Runners. Remember that one? Come on, I mean, right? Yeah. To Ralu. Whatever they say, it's a dumb, dumb song, but you can't get it out of your head, right? Once you sing it, the Tainted Love by Soft Cell is the number two all-time one-hit wonder. Remember that one? Uh, tainted Love. Anybody know how it goes? Uh, I can't. I, I'm trying to remember the song. Huh? It's a real slow song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a good song. Uh, I, I had the I had the tune in my head, but I lost it. But the number one one-hit wonder. Can anybody guess what it is? The number one top one hit wonder. If somebody's watching me. Nope. That's a good one though. Anybody else? I'm the Pied Piper. Yes. The Pied do, do, do. Another one hit wonder. It's the Macarena. Oh. The Macarena. Oh. And, uh, nobody knows who sings that. Those Del Rio. Who's that, right? They came with some, some older guy that just came up with this song. But if you mention Macarena, everybody starts, you know, the kids yeah. at school all do it, right? <laughs> That's the number one one hit wonder, right? And, and I didn't want to mention some of these songs because you're not going to be able to get those songs out of your head off for the whole day, right? You're going to be singing those, right? But people come up to these people that have these one hit wonders. They come up to them and they say, man, all you got to do is make a song just like the one you just did. And they're like, duh, we know that, you know, but we can't do it. You know, as much as they try, they've tried and they've tried and they've tried and they just can't do it. Did you know that it's harder to come up with the second hit after the first one? I write songs. I want to be a one hit one to two one of days, right? <laughs> who, says, who sings that song? I don't know. Some bald headed guy right beside you. But it's a good song, right? <laughs> you know, there's people though that have written songs, bands that have a lot of hits. Like the Rolling Stones. Guns and Roses. The, yeah, the, these guys, are the Rolling Stones even alive still? Did you, did you know that they're still touring? They're still out touring. They're going to come this year, right? <laughs> like, they're, my they're God. in their 70s. 
No, no, they're older. Yeah. They're, in their, they're in their yeah. 80s or 90s, yeah. something like that. They're old. They're barely standing up. They're barely standing up. Yeah, somebody has they're to go and hold them up. They put a they put a yeah. stick in the back of their shirt yeah, cool. and hold them up. They're playing guitar with their arthritis fingers. The Rolling Stones should be called the Roaches. The roaches. We can't get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're still around. They're still touring, right? There's a lot of bands that are still out there that you thought, these guys are dead by now, right? The Beach Boys, Billy Joel, they're still out there. Kiss is coming back already also. They're all around, right? But it's not easy to get another hit. All of these other guys that we just mentioned, they got hits all over the place, right? But these one-hit wonders, they could not do it. Today, we're going to take a look at a story in the Bible that tells us that God is not a one-hit wonder. Right. God is not a one-hit wonder, right? Today we're going to take a look at uh, a story that deals with a miracle that you might have heard before, right? Something, a previous miracle that had happened. And we're going to see that if God did it once, He can do it again. Yes. Not like the one-hit wonders that can't do it, right? They try and they try and they try and they can't do it. Man, I only have one good song in me, right? So I hope I have one good song in me nah. too. If you've ever seen the movie The Ten Commandments, you remember that? The parting of the Red Sea, all of that? Well, today's story, we're going to see that same miracle happen again. Today's story deals with Joshua, the Israelites, and the Jordan River. The Jordan River, right? We're going to take a look at it. We're going to divide this story into three parts. We're going to take a look at the obstacle, the miracle, and then the display of God's great power. Point number one, you... You and I, we need to look out for the obstacles in our walk with God. There's going to be obstacles. Verses 1 through 4. Let's take a look at that real quick. The obstacles that happen to us. Look at verse 1. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from... Somebody read that for me. Set out from what? Shittim. <laughs> Shittim? Sh I can't Shittim? get myself to say that word. Shittim. I can't get myself to say that. It sounds like a bad word. Shittim. They, they set out from and went to the Jordan where they kept for the crossing over. I can't say that word, so y'all got to say it for me. Every time it comes up in the Bible, I'm going to ask you to say it for me, right? <laughs> Joshua and the Israelites were camping at the Jordan River. Remember, they had been walking through the wilderness for how many years? Forty. Forty years. And their, their, their parents were worshiping idols. And God says, just because of that, you're not going into the promised land. You're going to walk till four, for 40 years until every single last one of you dies. And once you die, your children will be the ones that go into the promised land, right? Well, Joshua and them are there. It's time to go into the promised land. And they're at the River Jordan. The, 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 the Canaan, the, the, the land that flows with milk and honey is on the other side. They're on this side, right? It's over there, right? The, the place where there's peace and happiness and grapes the size of a basketball, right? You can sit there all day and eat one grape, right? And be happy for the rest of your life, right? But there was an obstacle. The river, the Jordan river was there so so what man the, 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 i can get across the san antonio river easy i could just jump in some places <laughs> right and get across the san antonio river that's where my dad met my mom when they first met when my mom how old were you mom when you met dad 13. 13. My dad was 30. No, no, no. <laughs> He's a few years older than her. A few years older. But they met up the San Antonio River. Right? My, my dad says my mom was, was, was had her feet in the river. And my dad walks by wearing a sailor cap. He was never in the Navy, but he would wear a sailor cap. Right? <laughs> so here we are at another river, right? <laughs> and it's an obstacle for the Israelite people to get across and the Bible says they could not get across and why look at Joshua 3 15 it says now the Jordan is at flood stage all during the harvest this is the time that they were there during the harvest it's at flood stage now the Jordan River is not like the Red Sea the Red Sea is a sea it's big it's huge right and, and, and God parted the Red Sea for Moses and the people the children of Israel that were with Moses right the water drew back. You know the story, right? And the Israelites walked across the Red Sea. Was it muddy? 
or was it dry ground? Dry. 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 dry ground, right? The Lord even dried up the ground for them, right? Think about that. Forty years later, forty years later, a whole generation died, right? Joshua is facing the same problem, but a smaller, it was a river this time, right? He did not have the Egyptians come and breathing down his neck either, right? But there's a deep body of water. And guess what? God did it again. God did it again. The same thing he did for Moses, he does it again for Joshua, right? For Joshua and the people that were there with him, right? I see in this story what I've seen over and over. I've been a Christian for 38 years, right? And I've seen this happen over and over and over. And you probably have too, right? That if God can do it once, He can do it again. If God can rescue you, if God took you off of drugs, He can do it again. If God took you off of alcohol, He can do it again. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're dealing with, God can do it again. So, man, God, but, but you don't understand my job. No, no, no. God can do it again. He rescued you before. He can do it again. You know why? Because God is not a one-hit wonder, right? God is not a one-hit wonder. Well, the Jordan River, like I said, is not as big as the Red Sea. It's usually about 100 feet wide. What's 100 feet? I guess from here to there, that's almost like 30 feet, something like that. So imagine 100 feet. And it's not that deep. It's about five, six feet deep. They can cross that, right? You, know, you can swim a little. You know, you might be up to chest deep. But it was at flood stage. The Bible says because of the flooding, it was one mile wide. And it was about 10 feet deep. And it was turbulent. It wasn't like the San Antonio River, brown and dirty. <laughs> Who made fun of who made fun of the senator one time? Who was it? A basketball player? Barkley. Bark, yeah. Yeah, Barkley. <laughs> he said, that's a dirty river. I didn't want to go there no more. Then he was making fun of the Mexicans too, right? The, the food we use. No, no, food is good. But anyway, it was a mile wide, ten feet deep. Women and children that can't don't know how to swim. They've they've been in the desert for forty years, right? When did they learn how to swim? They didn't. They didn't know how to swim. They had, you know, animals and all kinds of stuff with them, right? They can't get across. It's turbulent too, right? It's not, it's not just a steady river, right? God was making it hard for the people. Think about that for a second. Isn't that what God usually does to us, right? He makes things hard for us. Just like the Jordan River stood between the Israelites and the Promised Land, right? Many of you have an obstacle in your life, right? Standing between you and where God wants you to be. Think about that. What is your obstacle, right? It could be a financial problem. Maybe it's a relationship that you're struggling with. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe you're, you're dealing with drugs, alcohol, pornography, video games. You're playing too many video games. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a bad habit. Not coming to church is a bad habit. Did you know that? You've got to come to church. Come to church. It's a bad habit when you don't come to church. Maybe some of you are struggling with a certain sin, whatever that is, whatever it may be. It's an obstacle that's standing in your way to where you need to be in your relationship with God. It's an obstacle. That obstacle is standing between you and the promise God has made to us as believers, as Christians. It's standing between you and the peace that God offers and the abundant life that Jesus told us about in John 10.10. 10. Remember what he says there. He's talking about the devil. The thief comes to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. Destroy. Then Jesus says, but I came to give you life and life in abundance. Amen. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to live to be 130 years old? That's abundant? Yeah. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about giving us a good life here on this earth. It may not be riches. And there's nothing wrong with having money. I know many Christians and believers that are millionaires. But you can't even tell. They drive a Suburban. You know what I mean? And he could buy any car that he wanted to. But he drives a Suburban. A friend of mine. A good friend of mine. And he does it on purpose. He says, I don't want people to think, you know, that I think I'm all that just because I have, I'm a millionaire, right? So he gives us the abundant life. The Lord wants to give us that, right? But obstacles are a part of life. Nobody can get a, a, away from it, right? Obstacles, problems are going to happen. 
doesn't matter who you are, what you are, how much money you got, how much money you don't have, whatever, you're gonna have problems. As long as you're alive on this earth, you're gonna have problems. As the Chicano from San Antonio once said, every trail has some rocks. I said that. <laughs> Obstacles are inevitable, right? <laughs> don't we always say, God, why does this thing have to be in my way? God, take this obstacle out. Make it disappear, God. You're strong enough. You're powerful enough. Take this, take, take this obstacle away from me. Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't God take those obstacles away from us? Because that's not the way God works. Think about this. The Israelites, remember I mentioned earlier, because of their unbelief and because of their disobedience and worshiping idols, right? They had to go through the desert for 40 years. What are you not believing God for? Think about that. What are you being disobedient about with the Lord, right? How long will you have to wander through your wilderness until God gets you into the promised land, the land with peace, joy, and abundance for us as believers, as Christians, right? I heard of this pastor that every time there's a problem that comes up in the church, right? He says, oh, that's it. I quit. <laughs> I, I, I quit. I resign. I'm getting out of here. This church is over with. We're going to close the door. This ministry has no end. God is leading us to quit the church. Oh, we're just having a problem that the people are parking wrong outside. You know, there's no reason to quit the church. Right? Every little problem, the pastor wants to quit right away, right? <laughs> Sometimes God does lead us in different directions, right? We know that. However, just because there's problems, think about this. Just because there's problems, it does not mean it's a sign that it's time to quit. If every time you had a problem in your life and it, was, it meant it's time to quit, you'd quit your job today. Right? There's always problems at work, right? If, if, if every time a problem came up and it's time to quit, you'd leave your wife. Yeah. Wives give us problems. We never, right? It's never us. <laughs> it's always the wife's fault. <laughs> Think about this. <laughs> if every time you had a problem and it's time to quit, you'd walk out on your family. And you'd say, my kids are terrible. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with them no more. <laughs> Joshua and the Israelites are camped by the Jordan River, waiting to cross, right? They were not thinking about, well, does God exist or not? They were not thinking, debating about predestination or this or that, right? They were not fighting about whether should, should we go back to the desert and wander for 40 more years? They were not thinking about it. They were waiting for instructions from God on what to do next. They're waiting. They're waiting. Look at verse 2. Joshua chapter 3 verse 2. After three days, the officers went through the camp. The leaders went through the camp. Giving orders to the people. They're telling them, this is what we're going to do. You have been waiting. God has spoken. Right? He says, then you will know which way to go. Since you have never been this way before. They're going to the unknown. Have you ever been there? So we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know what next week. We don't know what next year, 2024 with the elections and all. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, but, oh, some of us are dreading if something goes, if it goes the wrong way, right? It's like, oh my God, four more years of that? We don't want that, right? <laughs> this is how you should approach every obstacle in your life. Think about this. When something stands between you and where God wants you to be, you're supposed to say, okay, God, I'm waiting. What do you want me to do? Show me. How do you want me to handle this problem, God? You got to come through, God. You got to tell me. You got to guide me because I don't know how to handle this, right? You should turn to your to the leaders in your life and ask them, what steps should I take? Who are the leaders in your life? Your wife, your husband, your pastor, right? Those of us that we know, that we trust. Sometimes it's our boss, but if our boss is not a Christian, you got to watch out, right? You got to watch out for that. But let me tell you this. Don't ever, ever <coughs> think about giving up just because there's a problem in your life. Don't ever think about giving up. Assume that God wants you to get through this problem. Okay, God, you threw this problem in my life, God. I'm waiting on your instructions. How am I going to handle this, right? I became a Christian at the age of 21. And I waited for 17 years for God to give me my beautiful wife. 17 years. Was that a struggle? Was that an obstacle? You better believe it. Man, it was tough. It was those of you that are single. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's hard. It's hard, man. But I waited for 17 years, and you know what? She was worth the wait. Because once Amen. the Lord gave me uh, 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 my wife Sandra, I said, man, it's like, yeah. 
Just yeah. like I can, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my family, right? Lord. Amen. He said, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord will bless you. The obstacles came in my way. But you know what? 17 years, I never gave up. I knew the Lord was going to bless. I knew the blessing was right around the corner. It took a long, it was a long corner, but it took a while, right? And having a child with special needs, yeah. lot, right? That's not been easy for our family. It's, it's, it's hard. It's an obstacle. It's an obstacle for him. It's an obstacle for us, right? That we're, 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 we're helping him. We're with him all the time, right? But we will never give up. Amen. We will never give up, right? It doesn't matter what comes our way, right? <laughs> having this attitude about these obstacles, that we're going to trust in the Lord, that the Lord's going to get us through this, right? It's going to help us with the next part of this story. Let's take a look at that real quick. Point number two. You must look for the Lord to turn your obstacle into a miracle. Be waiting for the Lord. That's what God does, right? That, that's what He does best. If He comes through, when we need Him the most, right? So let's take a look at what happened in the story of Joshua the Israelites in the Jordan River. Well, we know just like what happened with the Red Sea, right? The waters of the Jordan River were opened up and the Israelites crossed through the Jordan River. Was it muddy? Again, it was dry land. God did it again. They, the people, the Israelite people experienced a miracle because that's the kind of God that we have. God is a miracle-working God. That's what He does. We talked about that earlier, right? As we were worshiping the Lord, right? He does this supernatural stuff. God loves to show off. That's something that we need to get in our brains, get in our hearts, that God loves to show off. So when you have a problem, say, okay, God, I'm waiting. Show off in my life, God. Show everybody around me how great you are, how powerful you are. Show off, God. I'm going to wait, God. Send me a beautiful wife with green eyes and beautiful and gorgeous. And you know what? God did. God shows off. And man, I, I gave all these things, man. And you gotta be careful too, because God threw some 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 counterfeits my way too, right? And I thought, remember I told y'all before, right? I met a girl that looked like Raquel Welch, and I'm like, oh my god, that's her, God. That's her, she's the one. She didn't even want to come to church. And I'm like, ah, goodbye, Raquel Welch, right? <laughs> See you later, Raquel Welch. And then another Jennifer Aniston girl looked just like Jennifer Aniston, gorgeous, beautiful, and she wanted to go out with me, right? And I'm like, oh my God, come on. You're in, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> and then she told me too, you go to church too much. Yeah. If, when, if we get married, you're only going to go on Sunday morning. Yeah. And I'm like, I would go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday morning, we'd go doing evangelism, right? And she said, no, no, that, that's going to change. Goodbye, Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> you're out of here, right? <laughs> Think about that. God is a miracle working God. He's done, it. He's done it before. You know. You know what God has done in your life. You know how he's rescued you before, right? And he can do it again. Amen. If you want to see your obstacle turn into a miracle, there's three things you got to do. Let's take a look at this. First of all, get yourself ready. Get yourself ready. Look at Joshua 3, 5. Joshua 3, 5. Let's take a look at that real quick. Joshua told the people, you want to see a miracle? Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Do you want to see God do amazing things in your life? Do you want to see God do amazing things at South City Church SA? I do. I do. God's not done. What do you got to do? What did he say? Consecrate yourself. What in the world does consecrate mean? It means to purify yourself. It means to set yourself apart for God. My brother Pete, Pistol Pete, right? He would always tell everybody, he said, why do you call yourself Pistol Pete? He said, because I'm always loaded. He was always, he was always drunk or stoned or something, right? <laughs> so he was a Pistol Pete, always loaded, right? But he had a saying. And he would always say, one of these days, he would always tell me, Roger, I never had a nickname. I don't know why they never gave me a nickname. My cousin Ronnie, who gave us all these nicknames? We have a cousin. <laughs> was it your mom or my dad? Or my dad. 
Rana, yeah, Rana. That's where Rani came from, from Rana. Okay, is he? We call him Rana. And, and my, well, my cousin Armando was Pepino, and then we have Pechicho and Toto, and, and Pepe, Fat Pepe, all these guys, all these. I never had a nickname, I don't know why. But anyway, my brother Pete would always say, one of these days, I'm going to get my act together. He would always tell me, one of these days, but he wouldn't say, uh, uh, get my act together. He would use a bad word, right? He says, one of these days, I'm going to get my act together. One of these days. And by that, he meant that one of these days, I'm going to stop drinking. Because one of these days, I'm going to be a better father. One of these days, I'm going to pay more attention to my children. To consecrate yourself means to examine yourself. Examine your habits. Examine your thoughts. Examine your words. How are you speaking to people? I mean, I gotta always tell myself this all the time. God, you gotta help me with this, man. God, you gotta help me to get my act together. You gotta help me, God. The day has to come today, right? Think about it, South City Church. We gotta get ourselves ready. It's time to examine our lives closely and say, what am I not doing that God wants me to do? And what am I doing that God doesn't want me to do, right? We gotta look at our life thoroughly. And we gotta find out, okay, God, what direction do you want me to take? Are we the church of the living God or are we not? Right? Are we on a mission for God or are we not? Are we ready to take on the giants that are gonna be across the Jordan River on the other side in the land of Canaan? There's giants there. There's also the you know all the, the, the flows with milk and honey, but there's also giants that we're gonna to have to fight. <coughs> the second you gotta second thing you gotta to do to get ready to, to consecrate yourself, right? Get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Look at what God says to Joshua. Verse 8. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So it's a little different from the other miracle, right, with Moses and the Red Sea. What's going on? Look at verses 15 and 16. Now the Jordan is a flood state. We, we saw that, right? Yet as soon as the priests who carry the Ark reach the Jordan and their feet touch the water's edge, what happened? The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap. God had the leaders of the Israelites take their, take, they went first, they took a few steps into the river. Then the river parted. It was like God was telling them, you know what, don't just stand there doing nothing. Some of us come to church and do nothing. We think, okay, we're all right, we're going to be here Sunday after Sunday. I know churches that meet like this. They've been meeting for 20 years, and all they do is Sunday after Sunday, they just come meet for a little bit, and they go home. The rest of the week, they live like God doesn't even exist. And then they come back on Sunday. They do nothing. God is telling the, the, the leaders, you know what, don't just sit there and do nothing. Start moving forward. When you start moving, then you can expect me to move. Amen. Take the first step. Put your feet in the water. Get in there, right? There was this one guy, W.H. Murray, who said, you know what? Once you commit yourself to something, then things are going to start to move. Things are going to start to happen. Sandra started the women's ministry. They were, they were meeting once a month. We didn't know how it was going to go. Guess what? Things started happening. How much money do we have? What's our budget for the women's ministry? Nothing. Zero. <laughs> What supplies do we have? Zero. But guess what? Man, God has been blessing the women's ministry. They've, stuff has been donated. People are, are getting together. People are blessing because she took the first step. She stepped into the water. She said, God, I'm going to do this for your honor and your glory. When we started South City Church, a chain reaction started happening. We didn't know what was going to happen. Should we do it? Should we not? You know, most people with the North American Mission Board were trying to work through their mind. They said, get 12 families and start praying before you ever start the church. Get 12 families. <coughs> we don't got 12 families. It was just us. And we said, you know what? Let's do it anyway. Let's do it. Let's get our feet wet. Let's start it. And let's see what God's going to do. We felt the Lord telling us, go ahead. Do it. So we did it, and here we are, right? When you commit yourself to something, you're going to see the Lord 
back you up. You're going to see the Lord start making doors open. You're going to see the Lord start, things are going to start happening, right? Meetings are going to occur. Material is going to be provided, right? Amen. From Amen. Where you never expected people to give materials. All of a sudden, you're going to have all kinds of stuff coming your way, right? Yes. You've got to commit, though, to do something and start moving in that direction, right? And things are going to come your way. The key is to take that first step. The key is to get your feet wet. I'm guessing that when Joshua told the people, hey, this is our plan. The guys are going to go first and they're going to stand there. What do you mean, Joshua? Where's the boat to get us across? No, no, they're just going to stand there in the water. Their feet are going to get wet. But what, hold on, Joshua. That's not a plan, Joshua. You know, that's your strategy? Are you crazy? We want Moses back, you know. <laughs> what do you mean take a few steps in the water? What good is that going to do, right? <laughs> well, here at South City Church, I say, we're looking for a building. We know that, right? Should we merge with another church? Should we rent a fancy building that we can't afford? Should we get into debt, right, and buy a brand new facility? Some of you are thinking, man, I don't like any of those choices, right? <laughs> I don't think any of that's going to work, right? Well, here's what we've learned. We can learn from the story of Joshua, right? we got to just start taking steps into the water and then watch the water part. Watch what God's going to do. We moved into this building. We were over there, right, meeting over there. At the other place, right, we moved here. <coughs> it's an obstacle. Because there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done here, right? It's an obstacle in our lives, right? And, and, and for our church, for our meeting times, when we gather to worship the Lord. But we got to start looking for God to turn this obstacle into a miracle. Do you think He can do it? Amen. <laughs> I'm excited, man. Yesterday we had a, a brother Johnny and little Johnny and my dad. We came and took out that stove and all that. And Sandra was, and the boys were here. They were cleaning up in the back and everything. But you know what? <coughs> I'm getting, I'm excited. At first, I was like, man, this is, this, this is like overwhelming in this, this building, right? You know what I mean? We got to fix the floor. We don't want nobody to fall. And it's like, oh, my God. I don't know what that's going to do. All I know is that we're going to get our feet wet. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's wait and see the miracle that the Lord's going to do. <coughs> How do you get ready? Get behind the right people. Look at Joshua 3.12. Now then, choose 12 men. From the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. Get leaders, they're saying. Earlier in the chapter, chapter 3, right, verse, let's take a look at that. Look at what Joshua told the people. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, right, you are to move out from your positions and what? Follow it. The ark, remember the ark of the covenant? Y'all seen the movie, right? The ark of the covenant was a symbol of the presence of God. When they saw the ark, God's presence was there. Today, we don't have the ark of the covenant. What do we have? We have the Holy Spirit as a promise of the presence of God in our lives. God the Father leads us. The Lord Jesus Christ leads us. The Holy Spirit leads us. Guess what? The Word of God leads us. And you know what? Our brothers and our sisters in Christ help us to know what God wants us to do we gotta be looking out right if you're facing an obstacle and you want to see it turn into a miracle right you need to be <coughs> sure that you're in line with the right people don't be listening to the wrong people in your life right make sure that you're listening to the right people make sure that you're following in the footsteps of the right people make sure that you're surrounded by the right people because people will tell you all kinds of stuff to go out there right They'll tell you all kinds of stuff. There's 79 genders. What? Right? <laughs> Align yourself with the right people. Get the right leaders in your life, right? And then the rest is up to God. Point number three. You must look for God to display His great power. Look for God to display His great power. Well, how does the story end? Joshua 3, 16. Let's look at the earth. Joshua 3, 16. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan. So the people crossed over 
opposite Jericho. They made it into the promised land. They crossed over <coughs> on dry ground. The Lord our God did it. Look at what he promised Joshua in verse 7. Joshua 3, 7. Look at what he promised Joshua. He said, Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you Amen. as I was with Moses. This was part of God's plan. He sent the obstacle <laughs> on purpose. He said, I want to display my great power so that everybody will know, Joshua, that I am with you like I was with Moses. You're the new leader, Joshua. They need to know that I'm behind you, that I'm backing you up, Joshua. You're the new leader. Let me show the people what I can do. That's what it was for. It served the purpose for Joshua. It provided an opportunity for God to display His great power, right? That was one the, that's one of the functions of an obstacle in our lives when it happens, right? Think about this. In 2022, the average attendance at the Dallas Cowboys when they played a home game, it was 93,000 people would show up and fill the stadium. 93,000, that's a lot of people, right? Now imagine this. What if there was no opposing team? And the Cowboys were playing by themselves. Right, everybody line up. There's no defense. Okay, line up anyway. Guess what? Every play that we make is going to be a touchdown. Because <laughs> there's no defense, right? <laughs> How much fun would that be? You don't want to go see the Cowboys just to go practice. Some people like that, but no, you want to see a game. You want to see an exciting game, right? That it, just seeing in practice is not that exciting. Do you think 93,000 people are going to show up on a Sunday afternoon to go watch the team run some plays? No. They show up for the competition. If you go to a boxing match and there's just one guy in there hitting himself, how exciting is that going to be? You want to see two guys in there fighting, right? You want to say, okay, how good is it? Come on, man. Let's see what their tactics are. See how they end Let's see who gets knocked out. Let's see, you know, let's see how many teeth fly out, right? Why do we like to see stuff like that, right? But we do. We do. But the other team, the opponent, is a necessary obstacle for a competition like that, right? If they're not there, what's the purpose of having a competition, right? It's the purpose is to allow for the possibility of a great game. That's why you go to see the Cowboys and stuff, right? Playing like that. They lose all the time, but hey, <laughs> hey, 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 I'm still a fan, right? <laughs> the obstacles in your life, think about, set, serve the same purpose. They're a part of your life, right? All of us have problems. All of us, go, you can't get out of it. If you're alive, if you're a person, a human being, you're going to go through problems, right? But God has the power to work through your obstacles. You know why? So that... His name will be glorified. That's what he did with Joshua here. That's what he was doing. The conclusion here. As far as God is concerned, think about this. As far as God is concerned, every obstacle in your life can be transformed into a miracle. Isn't that great? It's like, send more problems, God. Send more obstacles my way. I want to see your great powers. Okay, slow down, God. You're giving me a little too many problems now, God. You know what I mean? Slow down, slow down. Some of us have been in church so long that when we see God make a miracle, we're like, oh, yeah, that's just another miracle. We take it for granted. But every time we see God move in somebody's life, we should be so excited. Oh, my God, I can't believe. Look at how God worked in your life. That is awesome. Look at what God is doing in your life. That is great. That is awesome. We need to be excited every time we see God work and, 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 and remove an obstacle and glorify himself to that obstacle. We should be excited about that and not take it for granted. Just because we've been a Christian for so long, oh, I've seen God. Oh, uh, uh, another alcoholic has been rescued. Oh, no, we said not, man. Praise the Lord, man. You were an alcoholic, so was I. Guess what? God rescued you. He rescued me. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. You didn't have to go through no twelve step, no none of that. It happened like that. The Lord can change you, right? What obstacle has God removed in your life? Think about this. Everything God has done in your life, His name has been glorified Amen. because of you. Because of you. God did it before, and He can do it again. He will do it again. 